Good morning or whatever time it is where you all are, because we are having a very international panel here. Um, I'm coming to you from the University of Melbourne uh, on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I would like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name is Mark Edele. I'm the Hansen Professor in History at the University of Melbourne, and I will chair uh, this session. This is part of a, a, a longer series um, of seminars on Ukraine, uh, which we put together in uh, reaction to uh, the war on Ukraine. Um, this is part of the uh, Melbourne Eurasianist seminar series, uh, but we organized this in uh, cooperation and with the support of the Ukrainian Studies Foundation of Australia and the Ukrainian Studies Association of Australia and New Zealand. And I would also like to acknowledge their support here. Um, we have a stellar panel uh, with us today. I will introduce the panelists uh, before they speak. Uh, they are Serhi Yekelchik, Olga Bertelsen, and Oksana Shevel. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and being with us today. Uh, the, the speakers will speak for about 15 uh, to maybe 20 minutes um, each in turn, and then uh, we will open up for discussion and I will try to moderate uh, a conversation between the panelists, but also uh, with the audience. Um, there's a Q&A function. Um, and please, uh, you can use the Q&A function um, while the, uh, the speakers speak. Uh, I will then curate the questions and, and present the questions to the panel uh, during the discussion in the, in the second uh, part. Uh, but you, can, you don't have to wait until we get to the Q&A. You can um, answer uh, or ask questions uh, as we go. Um, our first speaker is Serhi Yekelchik, uh, who received a PhD from the University of Alberta, but he was born and educated originally in Ukraine when it was still part of the Soviet Union. He's the author of seven books on modern Ukrainian history, on Stalinism, and on Russo-Ukrainian relations. His monograph, Stalin's Citizens, Everyday Politics in the Wake of Total War, was published with Oxford University Press in 2014 and was the recipient of the Best Book Award from the American Association for Ukrainian Studies. And its Ukrainian translation in 2019 received a special diploma of the Lviv Book Forum. Ikelchik's most recent publication is the second much expanded edition of his popular book about the Euromaidan revolution and the Russian aggression on Ukraine. The book is called Ukraine, What Everyone Needs to Know, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. And I understand that a third edition is uh, in the making. Uh, I'm a great fan of this book. I've recently praised it uh, in a, when I was asked, what, what is the one book you should read about Ukraine? And I said, read Serhi's book. Um, he's a professor of history and Slavic studies at the University of Victoria. Uh, Victoria, not in Australia, but Victoria, Canada. Uh, Ikelchik is currently also the president of the Canadian Association for Ukrainian Studies. And he will kick us off with uh, his paper tonight. Serhi. Mark, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you all for attending this webinar. It's a pleasure to be in Melbourne, at least in spirit, one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, the day will come, then it will be not just in spirit. Um, but for now, I'm joining you from the other Victoria as we, as we joke with friends and colleagues from your uh, state of Victoria. Um, and I'm joining you to talk about Ukraine, obviously. And the task ahead of me is actually a complex one. I have 15 minutes to introduce you to the emergence of modern Ukraine. As Mark has mentioned very kindly, I have a small book about that, where I do it in 200 pages. Uh, so let's see if I can manage in 15 minutes. Um, so Ukraine is very often called a young nation. 
But this statement is misleading in that Ukraine has ancient history. Uh, it traces its statehood to Kievan Rus, the mighty medieval empire, which for decades, for centuries really, was appropriated by the Russian Empire as its imperial past. But of course, the Ukrainian claim to Kievan Rus, the medieval state, is just as good as the Russian one and actually is better because if the Russian one is based on the continuity in the ruling dynasty and the seat of the archbishop, the Ukrainian one is actually based on everyday life and the people who lived on the ground continuously. Um, and so the capital of Kiev and Rus was obviously the city of Kiev, now the capital of Ukraine. And with this very brief intro, I walk you right away into a historical controversy because this contestation of Ukrainian past is one of the reasons explaining the Russian aggression. It is quite difficult for Russia to see that the ancient capital of Rus is in Ukraine. It basically forces them to re-examine the notion of what Russia is as an empire or as a nation or perhaps underdeveloped nation and overdeveloped empire. So it is a point of contestation, but I'm not going to dwell on it for too much now. Um, rather I would uh, move on in history to say that, you know, as, as modern historians, we are interested in social formations and everyday experiences. This is what for us, the meat of history, really, not the political history of the states, not the history of the great men and very rarely women, but it's actually the social processes. And if you look at the history of Ukraine this way, it would have been disadvantaged in the age of political history in the 19th century, for instance, and in the 18th, because there are significant discontinuities uh, in the state tradition in the Ukrainian lands. The next time a truly identifiable Ukrainian state formation emerges, it is actually the Cossack provinces of the Kingdom of Poland, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, which acquire a wide ranging autonomy, de facto independence during the war against Poland, the peasant war and religious war, which was led by the uh, Ukrainian Cossack leader Bogdan Melnitsky. But of course, if you look, if you look at continuities and cultural traditions and social life, there is no need for us to break Ukrainian history into the periods of having your own state and not having your own state, because the Ukrainians did continue to inhabit that area. And the dialects, as far as we can establish, the dialects were already present in the times of Rus. They were not a modern nation in, in a sense we know put into the term nation as a political community, but they were a nation in a sense appropriate for the age. For instance, within the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, there was an understanding of Narod Ruski, the people of Rus, not of Russia, but the people of Rus who understood themselves, at least the nobility did, and uh, the clergy and the Cossack officers as members of a very distinct entity, which is a constituent entity of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, but which is distinct uh, from the Pol Polish political nation. So this uh, understanding and this concept was always present. Now, of course, um, as you know, as you know, as a result of um, major political and military developments in much of Europe, and in particular in Eastern Europe in the mid 17th century, the time of the 30 years war, um, the Ukrainian Cossack polity led by Bogdan Helnitsky concluded an agreement with the Moscovite Tsar Alexis in 1654. The exact meaning of this agreement remains somewhat unclear to us. It could have been something uh, simple or something really important. We don't quite know whether they meant incorporation or whether it was a temporary military alliance uh, to make it even more uh, tantalizing, no original text has survived. We do know, however, that there was a very telling disagreement between the two parties right at the moment when they were supposed to sign. And of course, the moment of signing back in the 17th century involved taking an oath. And when the Cossack officers were expected to take an oath of allegiance to the Tsar, turned out that they had a similar request to the Moscovite ambassadors. They expected the Moscovite boyars, 
to also take an oath of allegiance to them uh, to observe the rights and freedoms of the Cossacks and the Ukrainian people. So two very different understandings of what a state is, of what subjects or citizens are, of what is the function of the ruler, met and clashed on that January day in 1654. And that indicates to us something fairly important, which of course Mr. Putin consistently denies in his historical writings about the unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And this is the presence in the Ukrainian historical experience of the European political and cultural tradition. And it's not just the notion of a social contract and obligations that are mutual, and the rights uh, of people which makes you citizens rather than not the modern citizens, but definitely not the kind of subjects of the despotic Moscovite Tsar. Of course, the envoys refused to take an oath. The agreement went ahead and eventually over centuries it developed into the Russian absorption of the Cossack lands and subsequently uh, other Ukrainian lands as well. That was handled as an imperial conquest. Uh, from very early on, already from the early 18th century, we can trace a well-defined plan to erase the specificity of the Ukrainian lands. And I don't just mean historical specificity in terms of organization and rights and freedoms. For instance, the, uh, the uh, state, the Ukrainian Cossack polity used regiments instead of provinces and hundreds instead of counties, and that eventually was lost. But it's also the specificity of the religious language, the books used and church services, and the Ukrainian language itself. By the time we arrive uh, in the period of Peter the First, there is a very clear drive to eliminate the autonomy. Catherine the Second says explicitly that she wants these so-called little Russian lands of the empire to be as much Russian as possible to eliminate any cultural, political, and social specificity. And, and they do go about it in an inconsistent, but occasionally extremely brutal way, both culturally and physically. And so then this establishes the development of modern Ukraine in an unequal dialogue with an empire. And we are, as scholars of the 21st century who know a lot about decolonization, recovering the history of the oppressed groups, we are familiar with the instruments we need to uncover this past, to reestablish the Ukrainian uh, agency and historical narrative. But somehow, but somehow the Russian narrative still finds its place in, in, in the Western mass, me mass media. It's, uh, it's not living without strong resistance. And then that there's a good reason for us to continue this line of argument and to say that modern Ukraine, the way we know it, not defined by, uh, the rights of the Cossack social group, not defined by the concept of the Rus land as it was in the medieval period, really emerges in the age of the imperial collapse. But the notion of what modern Ukraine is has been formed before that. Um, that happened in the 1870s, actually the late 1860s. Two important things happened during this period. First, the first ethnographic map of Ukraine is compiled. Once you put the map on paper and once it is printed, once the ethnographers and linguists uh, map the spread of Ukrainian dialects and very specific Ukrainian present uh, dress, that is the moment when you basically define the hypothetical future political nation, not just the cultural entity. And it becomes also a threat to the empire. The second thing, the Ukrainian experience is different. In the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ukrainian language is not banned the way it is in the Russian Empire since the 1860s. Publications in the Ukrainian language are banned. In the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Ukrainians do acquire experience of political participation and self-organization, which is actually very important. So 1917-1918, both empires collapse as a result of World War I and a variety of contradictions in, in the world at the time. Once they do, two non-Bolshevik Ukrainian republics emerge, one in the former Russian Ukraine and the other in the former Austrian Ukraine. By 1919, they proclaim the union. And something is achieved with this act on January, in, in January 1919, 
that becomes important for the entire history of the 20th century, uh, a precedent is created, not of controlling the entire Ukrainian ethnic territory. That is really difficult and messy between 1917 and 1920, but of claiming them based on the principle of national self-determination. Because of this claim and because of the fight the Ukrainian army puts up and Ukrainian peasants also resist, uh, eventually Stalinism and such, because of this fight, the Bolsheviks cannot just incorporate the Ukrainian lands into the empire and pretend that Ukrainians are Russians. Instead, the Bolsheviks create a puppet Ukrainian Republic, Ukrainian Soviet Republic, which is really run from the Kremlin, but it has the trappings of sovereignty. And that is the gesture, uh, a gesture, a political gesture, which acknowledges the pre-existence of the Ukrainian nation. So when Mr. Putin today blames it on Lenin, that Lenin for some reason had created Ukraine by taking pieces from Russia, Lenin was reacting to something. He was reacting to the Ukrainian Republic of 1917 to 1920, and so was Stalin. Moreover, in the 1920s, the Soviet state had to accommodate the Ukrainian peasantry because the peasantry was, you know, insisting on its language, and it had economic power for much of the 1920s. So the Ukrainian revolution, also politically it ended in November 1920, really ended with the Stalinist genocide, the Holodomor, uh, the famine, the state engineered famine of 1932-33, because it ended the concessions made to the Ukrainian national idea, ended the concessions made to the Ukrainian peasantry, and basically sought to kill as many peasants as possible, while at the same time arresting, exiling, and executing members of the intelligentsia, Ukrainian intellectuals. And that is a very, by now, it's a very recognizable recipe for genocide, uh, attacking, attacking the cultural elites of the nation at the same time as you try to exterminate a significant uh, physical component of the nation. So then when independent Ukraine emerged, in 1991, it was a successor of the Soviet Ukrainian Republic. It still remains so legally for the, for the purposes of legislation and various agreements and such, and even international property in some cases. But it also saw itself as a descendant of the Ukrainian People's Republic from 1917, the one which was the pre-existing precedent to which Lenin was reacting. And so it basically, inherited the history of resisting and helping destroy two empires, the Russian empire in 1917 and the actually Soviet empire in 1991. The difference as you realize is of course that the Soviets did recognize Ukrainians as a separate nation, but they actually needed to recognize them in order to kill them. That's the cruel irony of history. You need, you need to recognize ethnic difference in order to target this group in a genocide. And so, and so Ukraine then comes from a long historical tradition, which challenges the empire on great many accounts in, in a sense of historical rights to, to uh, the heritage, to the uh, glory of medieval Rus in terms of ethnicity, because Mr. Putin today and the Russian empire before 1917 thought that Ukrainians were part of the greater Russian nation. And perhaps most importantly, it challenges them the third way politically. Um, and here it's not just the notion of Ukraine being independent, but also the notion of Ukraine being an anti-imperial state, which became very prominent in recent decades. And also we do talk a lot about history and so does Mr. Putin and his rather rambling uh, press conferences and articles on this topic. We need to realize that every time we talk about history, we talk about the present and the future as well. If Russians consider Stalin to be a great leader, that also means that they're justifying Mr. Putin's regime. If Ukrainians believe that Stalin was a bloodthirsty tyrant and a murderer and dictator, that means they are preparing to embrace the concept of human rights as seen in Europe. So every time we talk about history, we talk about that. And of course, the very recent past, the recent past in which Ukraine underwent two revolutions in 2004, 2005, and 2013, 2014, the last one resulting in Russian aggression, are also 
part of the difference and challenge because they challenge Mr. Putin's political model. Uh, they demonstrate that it is possible for society not to be atomized the way it is now uh, in, in Russia, because it lacks any platforms really for coordinating and developing an oppositional movement, but for society to be united uh, at a level, um, which is not the level of the state, but the level of civic organizations. And if need be, revolting against the authorities too. So Ukraine then also is an example of current democracy, imperfect as it is, chaotic as it is, and corrupt as it is, hopefully not after that war, um, but it still challenges Russia fundamentally in an existential way. And so here we are, a nation which shares so much of history, suffered so many tragedies in the Russian hands, uh, a nation which could produce, you know, assimilated servants of the empire, reaching the highest levels of imperial bureaucracy, but as a group, consistently targeted and disadvantaged. And this nation is now challenging the Russian vision of what the world is and standing up to the Russian aggression. Thank you very much, Sehi. That was incredible in 15 minutes from Kiev and Rus to yesterday. <laughs> um, our second speaker uh, is Olga Bertelsen, who is an associate professor of global security and intelligence at Tiffin University School of Criminal Justice and Social Sciences in the Homeland Security and Terrorism Program. It's a very long, um, a, a, a very convoluted uh, um, identity in a way. Uh, she was educated at the Medical State University in, in Ukraine, in Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania, at Penn State University, and at the University of Nottingham in the UK. She published wild, widely on Soviet and Russian operations of ideological subversion, political violence in the USSR, and the methods and traditions of the Soviet and then Russian secret police. She's the author of the House of Writers in Ukraine, the 1930s, Conceived, Lived, Perceived, which was published in 2013, and the editor of three anthologies of archival KGB documents published in 2011 and 2016, which is very good for us because we have a, a, a research project on KGB uh, archives and couldn't go to the archives first because of COVID and now because of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin and his aggression against uh, Ukraine, and so we can't go uh, to the archive in Kiev. Um, she's also uh, an editor of two collections of scholarly essays entitled Revolution and War in Contemporary Ukraine, published in 2017, and Russian Active Measures in 2021. Her new book, In the Labyrinth of the KGB, uh, published in 2022 with, Lexi with, with Lexington Books, focuses on KGB covert operations targeting Ukraine's intelligentsia and the Ukrainian and Jewish diasporas. And Olga will speak to us about an aspect of this, this history of uh, the security services. Olga. Uh, thank you, Mark, for this introduction. And uh, uh, first, uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers for inviting me to be part of this important event and probably I have to apologize in advance if my voice fails because something is blossoming. So an allergic reaction, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, perhaps to divide my talk into two parts that are connected. Uh, and in the first part, uh, part, I would like to share with you some of my very general observations and research on the difference between you know, contemporary Ukraine and Russia which might at least partially explain Russia's invasion um, and its genocidal practices in Ukraine today. And in the second part, I will briefly discuss how the Russian secret services enforce and reinforce Soviet historical narratives uh, among Western academia and to an extent shape Soviet and Russian uh, studies, a topic that uh, in my view, has been um, under-investigated uh, in the West. There is no doubt that um, Russia's war inspired by Putin's obsession with solving the Ukrainian question once and for all, 
resembles at least to me Stalin's Polish complex and Hitler's anti-Semitic anti paranoia. And there is no need for me perhaps to, to repeat Soviet historical narratives um, embraced by Putin. We, we are familiar with these narratives. Ukraine is not uh, an independent entity, you, you, the Ukrainians are not um, a nation and so on and so forth. Uh, Ukraine uh, has been consistently portrayed by the Kremlin during the Cold War and under Putin um, as a land of Ukraine, Ukrainian fascist ideology and nationalism. And uh, Putin's real obsession uh, with Ukraine most recently uh, manifested itself in, I would say, medieval violence and ethnic cleansing uh, in Ukrainian towns and villages perpet uh, per uh, perpetrated by <clears throat> arm armed Russian soldiers against uh, unarmed civilians. Uh, keeping in mind um, Russia's history and the violence of its imperial conquest, uh, today we have a, a clear view of, of uh, what the Russians are capable of and what may lie ahead, of, uh, ahead for, for Ukraine. Gang rapes of women and little children in the Ukrainian lands occupied by Russian soldiers today, and their systematic pr protracted torture of civilians before they are killed continue to shake the world with its barbarism and brutality, crimes that um, actually accompany Putin's long-held aim of reading Ukraine of Ukrainians under the cover of a uh, uh, denazification operation. Um, I believe Norman Nymark was absolutely correct when uh, he suggested that ethnic cleansing is inherently uh, misogynistic and uh, Russian violence against women in Ukraine today, the, I would say the biological core of the nation create mental images of, of um, national humiliation and suffering that one simultaneously refuses to imagine and cannot forget. How is it possible? And everybody is asking today this question and how uh, did the Russians descend to this barbarism? Uh, one of, of many explanations was offered by the uh, brilliant Ukrainian writer, Yevhen Hutsalov, almost two de uh, decades ago. Uh, his, uh, his thoughts resonated with my personal understanding of Russian history, culture, and uh, perhaps the mysterious Russian soul. Having been murdered, spiritual, intellectual, and morally heroed from birth uh, by the authoritarian leaders, Russians have adopted a corpse ideology, worshiping despots and venerating dictators and tyrants, dead and alive, uh, a notion uh, coined by Hutzela in his absolutely beautiful, uh, prophetic, enlightening book, The Mentality of the Horde, Mentalny Stjordi. Uh, Hutzela drew parallels between the Russians' desire to um, perpetuate Lenin's principles by mummifying his body and eternalizing themselves by erecting and maintaining actually the mausoleum of their own illusions and historical myths. The Russian uh, themselves, the Russian writers, intellectuals themselves, from Maxim Gorky to Viktor Yerofeyev, those who uh, managed to develop analytical skills after centuries of authoritarian regimentation, suggested that over their history of brutal conquest and plunder, Russian people have forgotten, and I'm quoting here from Yerofeyev's. Um, Encyclopedia Ruskoye Dushi, his book, um, that over the history of, of this conquest, the Russian people for, have forgotten how to love, to produce and to want freedom, spending their entire lives in a correctional facility called the Russian Empire, where people's free spirit and morality have been systematically threatened, suppressed and punished. Um, the late Soviet dissident and Russian opposition lead, um, leader Valeria Novotvorska echoed this Hutzela's notion actually of uh, corpse ideology, suggesting that in contrast to Russia, Ukraine's ancient Tripilian uh, traditions grounded in agrarianism, um, cultural production and creativity seem to serve as a shield that helped Ukrainian uh, 
nurture a mentality that drastically differ from, from that of, of the Russians. And indeed, uh, centuries of, of this nomadic violence and bloodletting shaped the corpse ideology that saturated contemporary Russian society constantly adjusting the meaning of morality to its current needs and circumstances. Remember how um, Valery Brusov uh, was writing, uh, he wrote, uh, we, we are the uh, Scythians who sow death and fear, a people that got to cherish rampage and war. And this trait uh, cultivated under the golden horde that ruled over, by the way, Russia and Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Moldova and the Caucasus for nearly 300 years had survived in Russia having been nourished by violent invasions and plunder of, of foreign lands. Today, we have the opportunity to observe how for, uh, for the majority of Russian soldiers, the invasion of Ukraine has become, if you will, a shopping trip a shopping tour and an exercise in violence and pure sadism. Um, I would like to quote here uh, Alexander Gerzen, uh, who seemed to me um, grasped and um, internalized the Russian mentality that um, was absorbed from the Manhol Horde. He was writing, uh, despite our appearance, we are nevertheless barbarians. Our civilization is superficial, corruption is crude, and under the layers of powder and whitewash, whiskers and suntan are seen. We have a great deal of kindness and the adaptability of slaves where morality is circumstantial at best. According to the uh, surveys of, of many independent sociological research organizations, and we know um, a number of them, uh, including Levada um, Center, the majority of contemporary Russian citizens dream of recreating a historic Russia, following Putin's, Dugin's, and by the way, the late um, Jarinovsky's truncated, uh, truncated interpretations of history. And many uh, of their followers still worship, believe it or not, Lenin's corpse and long for, for Stalin's iron feast and patterns of governing. They perpetuate Soviet legacies, memories, dreams, uh, reviving today dead Soviet symbols and artifacts and modernizing them in the form of the letter Z that uh, it seems to me aesthetically and visually are consistent with the fascist swast swastika, right? Uh, the, Aforementioned Russian thinkers associated the Russian empire, their own empire with Asian despotism and identified the Russian people as a nation that is deprived of aspirations for building a Western-like democratic state. Russian society could choose from a variety of options offered after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but they have chosen to build a xenophobic, xenophobic uh, mausoleum designed to protect Russia from outsiders. And by the way, these mausoleums have been erected at all levels, if you will, in the form of Novorossiya uh, and the Russian Izborsky Club. Uh, and their aesthetic appeal has grown substantially in Russia over the last 10 years. Sadly, um, Putin's calls to denazify Ukraine has been popular among the majority of the Russian intellectual elites. Uh, if you remember uh, in 2014, individuals such as Dugin uh, have called for, for the killing of Ukrainians. He said every single citizen without exception should be killed, a plan uh, that Russian citizens are implementing in Ukraine today. And this genocidal rhetoric and lexicon have been embraced by mass Russian publics and they persist today. For this reason alone, I, I believe this is a Russian war in Ukraine rather than simply Putin's war um, characterized by the Russians constant imperial each, uh, Viktor Yerofeyev's metaphor again, each for, for conquest, violence and the redistribution of, of land and property. Um, as my most recent book shows, uh, and Mark mentioned this book, um, Russian genocides in Ukraine has 
uh, have never actually ceased uh, acquiring a special, I would say, sinister Qantas in the 21st century and today. And this link has become apparent in the context of Ukraine's history and Russian routine ethnic clans and operations in circlement tactics and famines, as well as um, the systematic extermination of Ukrainian culture and language. The Holodomor, uh, the marker of, of uh, Ukrainian history is merely an episode in this chain of Russian genocides. And today's mass killings, mobile crematoriums and filtration camps that are designed to um, eradicate even the, the, I would say the memory of the Ukrainian citizens presence in Ukraine. They're being executed today in the Donbass, even if they surrender. The narratives of, of fascist, uh, fascist Ukraine and Ukrainians as a nation of uh, Nazi collaborators are, are not new. And I'm inviting my um, esteemed colleagues who are listening to us today to read about uh, Soviet and Russian active measures that promote these historical myths in books that have been published, recently published, one by, for instance, Lub uh, Lubomir Lusyuk. It's here. I can show you if you can see the uh, Operation Payback and the other that I published in 2021, Russian Active Measures. However, in their drive to, to denazify Ukraine, the Russians are eager to denazify uh, all of Europe and to challenge the West. And this uh, sort of tensions between Russia uh, and the West fundamentally broken and escalated because of Russia's annexation of Crimea and its invasion of Ukraine's Donbass in 2014 prompted Russia to reconceptualize its approach to hybrid warfare activities against, um, against the West. Western academia has been identified as a pivotal target of active measures and the Western intellectual elites appear to be vulnerable and unprepared to deal with Russian ideological subversion. The formation of historical myths has a special place among a wide range of, of these active measures. And sustaining, I would argue, sustaining historical myths from the past helps Russia perpetuate more recent myths about wars in Georgia 2008 and in uh, Ukraine from 2014 as a response to NATO's encroachment on Russia's spheres of interest. Russian active measures have been vigorously conducted to undermine Western scholars' critical perspectives and to sustain Soviet historical narratives about the nature of Stalin's regime, uh, the Holodomor, the, the role of, of uh, Ukrainians as Nazi collaborators, and the paramount role of Russia in World War II, to name just a few. The ultimate objective of captation of, of Western scholars is to limit the conversation rather than to expand it about Soviet and Russian violence and genocidal practices in Ukraine and elsewhere, to obscure narratives about the Czechism in contemporary Russia, something that uh, Julie Fader and many other scholars explained so well, and to rationalize actually, and to justify Russia's authoritarian methods of governing and its aggressive foreign policy. Because I'm running out of time, I will just sort of um, mention only several sort of um, approaches, uh, Russian approaches, uh, which are instrumental to the success of this operation, operations. First, educating Russian citizens who are undercover agents at American and other Western universities. Their employment by Western academia the use of academic, uh, academic exchange programs for recruiting, for, for instance, American students as Russian agents of influence, captation of American and other Western scholars through grants, awards, scholarships, and other incentives. The use of uh, broad use of front organizations to facilitate, facilitate ideological subversion of scholars and broader audiences in all, a very subtle, I would say, a lengthy process that shapes the scholars' worldviews and inspires them to rewrite history to serve the Russian political leadership's goals. Uh, 
The best example, uh, of course, uh, of back in pro-Russian Western academic centers, NGOs and think tanks is the infam infamous Rossotrudnichestva. A lot of people wrote about this. And uh, my research on the Russian Council uh, on Foreign and Defense Policy, known as SWAP, Soviet Pomnishnia Baronna Politiki, these front organizations offer handsome, handsome rewards and broad opportunities to those historians who, whose publications and public talks follow the, will follow the, the Kremlin's talking points and its official version uh, of history. And other methods, and, and you of course know about this, oral and written disinformation distributed among Western academic, academics and launching defamatory academic campaigns, academic campaigns targeting Western scholars who challenge pro-Soviet and Russo-centric historical narratives. And finally, finally, the use of mass and social uh, media and the agents of influence. Um, of course, some Western scholars are unaware of the fact that they are targeted and communicate with Russian agents of influence. They become active participants, unfortunately, in Russian covert operations contributing to the uh, popularity of Russian narratives and uncritically repeating them and reposting them, being oblivious of, of their origin, falsities, and intent. And there is another group, of course, others, other scholars who consciously work for the FSB or Gereu, their worldviews were shaped by their parents who in the past occupied the leading posts in the KGB uh, and or they were simply recruited by the Russian secret services. So in conclusion, just a, a few thoughts. I think uh, a close analysis of, of these tactics and strategies by Russian intel suggests that they're fundamentally entrenched in Soviet secret services traditions. It is not to suggest that uh, the views of certain scholars in the West should be chastised or that they should not be allowed to say or to publish what they say or publish. It's not about that. Open debate is a significant feature of democracy. Yet the Western academic community should be aware of, of these manipulations employed by the Russian secret services that help them promote fallacious discourses, narratives, and pure disinformation that often inform Western analysis and shape Western decision-making. Russian ideological subversion of Western academia manifests itself in firmly embedded preconceptions about Russia in the minds of many scholars, preconceptions that have little to do with realities, but rather based on carefully built um, and argued constructs, misleading and dangerous uh, for the West and for our young scholars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Uh, our third speaker is Oksana Shivel, who is an associate professor of political science at Tufts University, where her research and teaching focuses on Ukraine and the post-Soviet region more generally. Her current research projects examine the sources of citizenship policies in the post-communist states and religious politics in Ukraine. Her research interests also include comparative memory politics and the politics of nationalism and of nation building. Oksana is the author of, award, of the award-winning Migration, Refugee Policy, and State Building in Post-Communist Europe, published with Cambridge University Press in 2011, a book which examines how the politics of national identity and the strategies of the UNHCR shape refugee admission policy, policies in the post-communist region. And I will, at, I, uh, just as an aside, several of, uh, several of um, members of the audience have asked for links to the books mentioned, and I'm I, I'm trying to, as I'm listening, uh, also posting them. So some of them I have posted in the um, in the uh, uh, Q and A in answer to one of those requests, and I'll, I'll try to pick up the others as we go along. But I'm also trying to listen, so it's uh, a little difficult. Um, Chevelle's research appeared in a variety of journals, including Comparative Politics, Current History, East European Politics and Societies, Europe-Asia Studies, Geopolitics, 
nationalities papers, post-Soviet affairs, and the Political Science Quarterly, as well as the Slavic Review. She also published in a variety of edited volumes. She's a member of Ponar's Eurasia, the Ponar's Eurasia Scholarly Network. She's a country expert on Ukraine for Global Citizenship Observatory and an associate of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. She currently also serves as president of the American Association for Ukrainian Studies and vice president of the Association of the Study of Nationalities. And she still finds time to speak to us today. And she actually came from another seminar before she came into this. So she's a very busy uh, scholar. Oksana, please. Thank you very much, Mark, for this generous introduction and for inviting me uh, to join the panel. So I'll be picking up and building on what um, Sergei and Olga already talked about. And I specifically want to maybe talk a little bit more about identity changes in Ukraine um, that are ongoing as we speak and that have also been uh, ongoing for quite some time, especially since 2014. And then I'll also uh, speak kind of in light of the um, Russian narratives and designs of Ukraine and Ukrainian perceptions of self and um, of future for the nation and their country, what we might expect um, as far as the outcome of this war. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball, but I think we can talk about um, things that are potentially uh, more and less likely. So let me start with a few comments on the evolution of Ukrainian identity since 1991. Sergei walked us through the history of the formation of Ukrainian nation. So when Ukraine emerged as an independent state, um, as the Soviet Union ceased to exist in December 1991, um, this complicated historical past uh, had its imprint um, on the population, um, now citizens uh, of independent Ukraine. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this very broad kind of brush characterization of Ukraine as divided uh, between the so-called East and West, um, with basically population in the West and center of the country being more both ethnically Ukrainian, um, sort of higher concentration of both ethnic Ukrainians, Ukrainian speakers, um, and um, people having kind of more pro-Western preferences. And by contrast, population in the South and the East of the country, given their long time period in Russian, um, uh, under Russian rule, uh, starting um, with the um, controversial Bogdan Khmelnytsky, so-called unification, um, right, and then how the borders of the different empires shifted over the territory, basically the population being uh, both more greater concentration of ethnic Russians, Russian speakers, um, and people with more pro-Russian preferences. Now, this sort of simplistic um, interpretation of Ukraine um, is not completely without foundation, because again, if we look at, say, electoral maps of Ukraine, especially from the 1990s and into the 2000s, there is certainly sort of East, you know, West divide in electoral preferences. But uh, scholars who have studied identity in Ukraine have, um, and I know some of them are in the audience, Volodya Kulik in particular, you should all read his work um, on identity in Ukraine if you haven't yet. Uh, but, um, you know, sort of to put it briefly, the story of this regional divide was much more complicated than sort of simple East-West, um, what it actually meant, um, you know, to what extent uh, ethnicity, language, um, region played a role in the formation of political preferences um, is a much more complex story, but which I'm not going to go into just because there isn't really time. Uh, but what, what we do, what I do want to comment on that even if we accept this sort of broader divide between quote unquote more pro-Russian, Russia friendly East and South and more pro-Western, pro-Ukrainian um, uh, West and center, the border between these uh, two parts of Ukraine um, has been shifting progressively since 1991. We can see that in the, say, electoral vote for more pro-Western parties if in the first presidential elections back in December 1991. The most pro-Western candidate, Vyacheslav Chornovil, wins just in the Galician region uh, that were part of the interwar Poland. Then already by 90, the next round of elections in 1994, parliamentary election for Western Party Ruch sort of shift that boundary to the east. And then the shift continues um, all the way to Dnipro River and then ultimately um, passed uh, into the uh, east and south of the country um, in the after 2004 um, Orange Revolution. So uh, what basically we see that, you know, this process of identity formation was never static. Um, the establishment of Ukrainian state and of the normalcy of Ukrainian statehood um, was um, 
um, becoming more and more accepted uh, by the population of Ukraine. Of course, there was great support for independence at the time of sovereignty. I mean, at the time of the uh, vote for uh, Ukrainian independence referendum in December 1991. But then was the economic, um, you know, collapse, and you know, people voted also for independence for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, some of them were maybe more material and economic than ideational. But anyway, sort of the shift is important, right? So there was basically a progressive, we can say, consolidation of more uh, a stronger Ukrainian identity, um, by the same time lessening of um, identification with the USSR and any kind of Soviet, Soviet identity, which was uh, quite uh, prevalent, or, or at least present in Ukraine in the early 1990s. And also even um, say when people were asked to rank the importance of say their regional identity, ident identifying with a particular region as opposed to with the, with the nation, again, national identity was strengthening. Now, all of this, you know, this process is really accelerated after 2014. And here we have quite a bit of an irony because of course, once um, 2014 Euromaidan resulted um, in the removal of then president Yanukovych who uh, fled to Russia and uh, Putin has portrayed uh, these events not as a popular uprising against authoritarian leader, which is exactly how it is perceived by majority of people in Ukraine, but as some sort of Western ploy um, to dismiss or to remove illegitimate government in essentially Western Western sponsored coup. And this whole narrative that you know Ukraine, um, I mean Sergei was saying there is historical perception of uh, Ukraine as not really being a legitimate quote unquote nation. Uh, but um, I would say that in Russia, this whole narrative it, kicks into high gear after 2014, because now there is this argument that, well, if Ukraine was sort of problematic to begin with, now it lost all, all legitimacy, exactly because this quote unquote neo-Nazi government is now running the country and Ukraine is a Western puppet. Um, and Russia must do something to keep Ukraine um, in its sort of proper place in, its, in Russian sphere of influence. And here comes sort of the great irony, because of course, uh, after 2014, what Putin does, he moves to an ex Crimea, he sponsors this uh, separatist war uh, conflict um, in Donbas, uh, essentially instigates it and ultimately supports it. And all of this is done um, to keep Ukraine kind of closer with Russia, right, to prevent Ukraine's turn to the West. But in fact, in Ukraine, it completely backfires and it produces the opposite result. So if we look at uh, attitudes on any kind of issues, uh, be they on NATO membership, be they on the membership in the EU, or generally stronger identification with Ukrainian identity as opposed to Russian identity for people who were oftentimes had multiple or complementary identities, they would say, I see myself, you know, partly Ukrainian and partly Russian and maybe more Ukrainian, more Russian. So we see this, and again, uh, I would again reference Vladimir Kulik's work who has documented these shifts um, in various surveys and published results of this. So we see essentially Putin's strategy backfiring. So instead of, you know, Ukrainians being kind of, um, you know, seeing the light of day, as Putin would say that they were ruled by this illegitimate Nazi government and they really ought to do with Russia, we see the exact opposite. Um, so kind of twofold process, process unfolds in Ukraine. On the one hand, there is this changing of identity and it is really quite profound. I'll just give you a few, you know, just by way of an example, for example, membership um, in European Union as opposed to Russia-led customs union, which was in Ukraine, there was always somewhat slighter preference even before 2014 for membership in the EU, but not dramatically so, like a lot of people favored membership in the customs union. So that these opinions completely diverge. So in other words, more and more people now fa favor membership in the EU, vast majority, and very few membership in the customs union. Even more dramatically, the attitudes to NATO change. If before 2014, there was hardly 20-25% through all the years in the opinion polling that favored Ukraine's membership in NATO, after 2014, these numbers begin to increase. And just on the eve of the invasion of this current invasion in February, the research that was done again by a group of scholars, um, including Ola Onok from University of Manchester, who were doing research in different regions of Ukraine, they found out that for the first time, not just nationally, because nationally it was already beginning to emerge after 2014, but even in historically so-called pro-Russian regions in the South and the East, in those regions, preferences for NATO outweigh opposition to NATO. So that's really unprecedented. And again, really ironic that Putin kind of, you know, can be can take credit for this, um, for this change of attitude. And of course, additionally, once Crimea was annexed and um, these uh, proxy republics were established um, in Eastern Donbass, about 12% of the Ukrainian electorate was cut out from participating in the Ukrainian elections. And 
these were the most pro-Russian or Russia-friendly voters. So it became additionally mathematically much more difficult and you know, some have argued impossible for any sort of pro-Russian uh, party or candidate uh, to win at the national level. Right? So we have this twofold process on the one hand, identities in government control parts of Ukraine are becoming much more kind of negative towards any Russian project or association with Russia. And on the other hand, this mathematical sort of removal of the most pro-Russian electorate from the voter roll following the annexation and the war in Donbass um, further makes it essentially Putin's designs for Ukraine much more difficult to accomplish. Now, Putin, of course, has not learned from any of this. Um, in fact, it's also quite um, you know, interesting and also troubling that he has repeatedly denied and dismissed um, all the evidence from Ukraine that shows um, these changes in popular attitudes. So when he was explicitly asked about it um, in one of the, I think the latest Valdai meeting, uh, so, you know, he says that Ukrainians are really part of Russia, but what do you make of these opinion polls? His response has been kind of along the two lines. One is to say that these opinion polls are just fake and cannot be trusted because, you know, like the people are basically, that the basic opinion polls are rigged or kind of a little bit more nuanced argument to say that Ukrainians are hiding their true pro-Russian preferences. In other words, they're so oppressed by the quote unquote Nazis in the government that all these pro-Russian Ukrainians are just lying to the pollsters to say that they are in fact pro-Ukrainian, right? And I think this misperception or wishful thinking really in, in, informed the decision to invade because if that's, if you believe that really these people are ultimately, you know, Russian and they would welcome Russian troops, once they're liberated from their Nazi so-called so government, that you would expect the welcome um, of the troops um, in, uh, especially in historically kind of more Russia-friendly regions in the South and the East. And of course, that's not what happened. And we see this, you know, I think the current purges and the rest of various, you know, FSB personnel and people responsible for uh, managing Ukrainian affairs, I think shows Putin's displeasure was the, the outcome, but again, it was it was not really a secret. I don't think you need to be a particularly sophisticated FSB agent if you were just paying attention and taking seriously the evidence from Ukraine since 2014 that that's just not going to be the reception um, to the invasion, right? Now, which sort of leads us to the question, like, what's next, right? Like, what could be, like, what's happening now and what might, you know, might happen going forward? Here, I would say that, first of all, Russia really does not have any path to victory. So there is the way that they cornered themselves with this narrative a very maximalist narrative um, that Ukraine is not a real country, that Ukrainian people are not really a real nation, that they are either at best a victim to be saved because they have been oppressed by Nazi slash NATO slash US, you know, you pick your villain, right? Or they are completely a puppet um, and or, right? Completely a puppet of the West, essentially staging, staging ground from which NATO was going to attack Russia. Um, send, you know, bats with biological weapons or missiles or all of the above, um, you know, it's, it's, the narrative sounds almost like ridiculous to the outside observers, but by all accounts, that seems to be the narrative that the Russian state has advocated and the rationale for this war. Um, they are not only denying, you know, various facts from Ukraine, like the brutality of their troops, the, you know, the murders in Bucha and elsewhere, but they're even denying the fact that they attacked Ukraine. The war is presented as a war of self-defense. Uh, whereby Russia acted in self-defense to prevent supposedly imminent attack from Ukraine on Donbass, Russia broadly, uh, you know, weapons being launched um, through, you know, NATO, NATO activities in Ukraine and so forth. So that makes essentially for Putin, I think, very difficult um, to imagine any kind of off-ramp, so-called off-ramp, right? There is a lot of discussion in some of the media that, well, you know, to end this war, Putin needs to be offered some kind of off-ramp. But I don't think there is an off-ramp that would be even remotely acceptable to Ukraine. That because any additional land grab, right? Even if we can imagine that, say, Putin may be temporarily satisfied with, say, controlling greater part of Ukrainian territory. Let's say they, if they were somehow managed to uh, conquer Donbass, not, not just conquer it, but actually control it, and southern Ukraine, and that could be then presented, you know, to Russian public as a win, maybe like as at least temporary, like maybe that would be acceptable to Putin. But that's certainly not acceptable to anybody in Ukraine, including the government and the public, because that would mean, you know, more brutality. That would mean occupation. That would mean all sorts of horrible things that we now know was, was happening. The quote unquote denazification, as Olga was saying. It's not really about anything sort of objectively having to do with the Nazis. It's essentially a plan to eliminate anything, you know, anything and anyone who holds distinct views on Ukrainian identity, who does not agree with this Russian perception that Ukraine is really part of Russia and the fake state. Um, so it is a very convenient catch-all phrase that anybody who opposes Russian identity 
then we can be labeled as Nazis and we see this from going after you know Ukrainian language teachers to any kind of people perceived to be pro-Ukrainian in all these localities. So denazification is nothing short of genocide of anybody who holds um, you know Ukrainian identity and uh, wants to see uh, an independent Ukrainian state. So that's completely not unaccept not acceptable uh, for for Ukraine. Um, and of course, even if say it was to be somehow acceptable, um, you know, it, it, to Ukraine, it would still not solve um, not solve the conflict permanently, because um, for Russia it would be just the first part of the piecemeal annexation. Given the way Ukraine is portrayed as a legitimate formation, as this, as they call it, anti-Russia, created by the West, supported by NATO, um, as long as sovereign Ukraine exists, supposedly Russia is in danger, right? So there is really no kind of point of overlap, I would say, um, that um, we can imagine, you know, some sort of off ramp whereby peace and stability could be established long term. So which I think leads me you know, to the last point that I'll make that I think it's, it's not a very optimistic scenario, but I think, first of all, we are likely to see this conflict to continue for some time because Ukraine will continue to fight. Um, it's, um, I'm not a military analyst, but I'm very skeptical of uh, you know, those uh, people who also, for the most part, not military analysts, who would claim that Ukraine cannot win. I don't think that's at all the case. I think it's an open question, and it's certainly an argument can be made that Ukraine can win militarily, not talking about marching to Moscow, but win as in like making uh, the military battle so costly for Russia that it would be forced to withdraw from the territory that it has occupied since February of this year. Um, again, we can address more of that in the QF done, like, you know, this whole Russian army being second strongest army in the world. I think many military analysts actually questioning this conclusion. Of course, if we add to it the determination and the morale on the Ukrainian side as opposed to the Russian side, so a lot of, you know, argument could be made. You know, I wouldn't say that we know for a fact one way or the other, but I don't think we certainly cannot, we shouldn't conclude that there is no way Ukraine can win. Um, now, um, if, um, but again, the cost of this could be tremendous in terms of human cost and the destruction of human life. Um, whichever way the, the military outcome is likely to play out, I don't think we can talk about some sort of new normal and renewed stability in Europe um, as long as Putin's regime remains in power in Russia. Um, the new, if you want to call it a Cold War or an Iron Curtain, I think either way there is growing realization in the West and I think rightfully so that uh, Russia, authoritarian Russia, at least Russia ruled by Putin, is certainly a danger, not just to Ukraine, but globally to Europe, um, the kind of objectives that Putin states. Um, yes, that NATO wants to avoid war with Russia, but Putin already says he's in war with NATO. So I don't think ultimately any country would be considered safe if Putin is able to get away with additional territorial grab in Ukraine in particular. So um, medium to long term, again, we, we, we can talk more about in the Q&A also sort of what is and not likely to happen in Russia, but I think as long as the regime there stays what it is, we probably will be looking at a new Iron Curtain, and I think we should be certainly considering the possibility very seriously that Russia has to be has to be contained, um, and um, it will be a permanent source of tension. Right? Things might change if there is, you know, different regime um, in Russia, but that would be up to the Russian people and Russian elites, or maybe some unprecedented, you know, historical we've seen um, regimes that seemed forever until there were no more. So that cannot be included, excluded in Russia. So I will end with that um, and uh, welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I had trouble with my cursor here. Um, we have a few questions. Um, I actually want to start with one which picks up a little bit from uh, where Oksana ended, um, and that is whether or not we have an idea of what Putin's end game is. And I mean, I would add as a sub question there. Does Putin have an idea of what his end game is at this stage? Um, so, and and the, so so what what's the end game? Does he want to you know rebuild the Soviet Union? Once does he want to create satellite states um, in Ukraine or further? Um, and is this about recreating the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire? So there's there's a, a several nested questions, but I would 
would quite uh, like to hear your answers. So, and maybe, I don't know, Oksana of, uh, should put you on the on the spot, but maybe you could could begin trying yeah, to- Yeah, I, I, can, I can start. I don't think ultimately any of us knows what his end game is. I think like, I, I mean, I would actually, if you, as you said yourself, I think he may not himself quite have completely determined what the end game is. But I think once some things we can be pretty sure about, I think certainly the view of the world where there are, whereby there are sovereign nations, including so-called smaller nations, and these nations have as much right, you know, to self-determination and sovereignty and deciding their policies as quote unquote bigger nations. I think that is certainly not his plan. I think it is absolutely certain that Putin considers, first of all, not only Ukraine artificial creation. So as far as his designs for Ukraine, I think some sort of at the very best puppet government, which I think was the original plan to install some kind of puppet government in Kyiv and then basically turn Ukraine into like a vassal state, right? So it may still potentially exist on the map, but would be deprived of any and all sovereignty and not just foreign sovereignty. It also extends, I think, to domestic politics. So things like education policy, language policy, memorial policy, all of these things would be basically determined by Russia. So I think there is this broad incompatibility uh, bet between, um, you know, Putin's vision of Russia as, you know, great quote unquote power imperial state entitled outright entitled to dominate it in this, its, its, its immediate neighborhood. So it's not necessarily restoration of the Soviet Union, um, where formally at least, right, different nations had, um, you know, equal rights and so forth, right? There were different languages and there was a goal to build communism. I don't think that's Putin's goal, but certainly domination of um, its neighborhood by right. I think that's part of it. I think uh, another thing I would mention that um, seeing Western democracy, as uh, both a danger to Russia and some sort of grand hypocrisy, I think would be another part of, of his vision, because Ukraine was dangerous for Putin, not only because um, you know the people dared to think of themselves as a separate nation, which were they really Russians and all of this. I think the precedent of functioning democracy in Ukraine uh, was dangerous also for Putin politically, because that would be exactly the opposite of the political model he created in Russia. And an argument could be made, you know, if Russian people would say, look, here is this, you know, country that is not that different from us, historically, culturally, otherwise, they have functioning democracy, like, why can't we have that, right? Again, I'm not saying that necessarily Russian people would have, you know, followed the lead and rebelled, but that's clearly how Putin perceived it. So this whole colored revolutions are very, very, you know, dangerous to him. He does not believe that people have agency. So I think, um, you know, that's kind of long winded answer to your question. The short answer is, I don't know what his end game is, but I think we can at least talk about some concrete building blocks of whatever that end game might be, which I think probably would evolve given what he can and cannot accomplish in the medium to short term. Yeah, I mean, that, that part, right? Um, what Ukraine shows in a way is that this, this claim, which is sometimes made by kind of Russian state aligned elites that you know, we're culturally different, you know, we're East Slavs, we're different. We, we have different types of democracy here, managed democracy um, and so on. And, and Ukraine shows that, you know, you can be perfectly fine East Slav and, you know, have Western style democracy um, where you change your leader quite frequently, which is not something Putin is very keen on. Um, Oksana, do you want to uh, speculate on the end game? Putin's endgame. Sorry, oh, I think you mean Olga, right? Olga, so, sorry, sorry, I got, sorry, Olga. Okay, I, I mean, uh, nobody can know this for sure what is going to happen, but uh, history confirms that all authoritarian leaders uh, end up badly, right? Uh, and uh, clearly he perhaps, as a matter of fact, he's already a corpse with, with uh, um, not much power over his own country uh, who is left there. But at the same time, having said that, I have to um, admit that now Russia is very um, not fragmented because those who disagreed with Putin, they left the Russian Federation. They are also like many Ukrainians are scattered all over the world. Those few who disagreed with, with his policies and with his actually uh, denazification operation. So now uh, Russia is perhaps might be considered a monolith uh, with this negative energy 
but it, again, as Oksana mentioned, this uh, sort of metaphor, it can backfire, I mean, uh, against Putin. A and uh, all kinds of plots are possible, assassin including assassinations. Um, you know, it's interesting, I I'll tell you another thing that I, <clears throat> over the last two months, I attended three or four uh, Intel um, conferences and people, Intel people are seriously uh, talking about um, some kind of covert action uh, on, on Russian soil. And uh, many people are asking this particular question, is it possible? Because this is just the, the, the scheme or this um, idea of neutralizing Putin uh, might quite you know, be attractive for many people because that's the goal of, of many. Imagine how you can live your life that the whole world now desires you uh, that he's going to be, he should be um, dead. But my point is that uh, many until um, specialists concluded that probably it's not um, the, the era of the Cold War. Uh, I advanced and probably might prevent uh, even the most sophisticated intel agencies such as the American intel community uh, to, to, to be successful in any covert operation that might be potentially conceived and launched uh, and executed on, on, uh, on Russian soil. And we know, we understand why. But uh, we, again, we don't know what is going to happen, but uh, I, considering the previous question, I would like to mention this briefly, uh, one important factor um, that uh, money, we shouldn't forget about the money. Nobody canceled the, the money factor. And uh, the, we still have large deposits uh, in the Donbass, and Putin is after these deposits. Uh, well, of course, he is also after... Um, complete control of the uh, Black uh, Sea Basin, because we know that under the, the flow of the Black Sea, that there are a lot of interesting things, oil, gas, and so on. And he wanted complete control uh, over this particular basin for a long, long time, including, by the way, the Turkish Straits. Uh, he's been dreaming about this for forever, and we know uh, it's a long history about how the Russians wanted to take over. So, I mean, don't forget that uh, this, uh, this is also a motivation for him uh, to, to go after Ukraine, to go after, uh, after those people who are members of NATO, including Bulgaria, including um, those uh, states that um, are coastal states um, surrounding the Black Sea. So, I mean, uh, this is just a very powerful motivation for him to get more money because now sanctions are working uh, and something has to be done. He has to think ahead. Yeah, there's, there's another question on, on the economic, potential economic motivation, which I want to come to next, actually, which would uh, piggyback on, on, on your remarks on uh, oil, gas, and so on. Um, Sehi, do you want to uh, add? Very quickly. Yeah, happy to. Um, you remember that the original plan was actually to drop some paratroopers from uh, helicopters in the Pechersk district of the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, and in this way to solve the issue before the Russian troops could actually even approach any, any big city. And that indicates a particular picture of the world and uh, of Ukraine too, from which Mr. Putin proceeded. Um, which makes many us historians think of that moment in 1941 when Hitler famously or infamously said that the Soviet Union is not a real state and once you kick in the door, the building is going to collapse. And it's interesting that Russia claims, you know, so much special expertise in winning World War II, but somehow this point from Russian history textbooks is not being applied uh, to the analysis of Ukraine. So Mr. Putin in this situation ended up being the Hitler who, uh, who was trying to kick the door and destroy the Ukrainian state. But then, of course, this parallel has the reverse, which is also interesting and perhaps uh, uh, important. And that is that Stalin's state was strong, right? 
And so Mr. Putin's state, his regime can also be uh, sufficiently strong to withstand even some military defeats, especially if they are publicly denied in the Russian media. And of course, if you follow the Russian media these days, you know that the picture of the war presented there is nothing like what you get uh, through the Western media. So basically, uh, Mr. Putin had to accept at some point that uh, the end, the desired end of this war was not achievable and devise a new plan. And then the next plan after that, after he spent uh, more troops originally intended for the conquering of uh, the Western parts of Ukraine, central and Western parts, sending them on the Eastern Ukraine, not achieving the strategic target there. So he had to revise his expectations once more, really. So that is a good sign, right? That he, he realizes that his vision of Ukraine was so flawed that it cannot possibly be a foundation for uh, for a peace settlement of any sorts. But of course, the uh, regime Mr. Putin is running is a kind of a charismatic dictatorship in which you have to be photographed by a chested on a horse and fishing and doing other things. It's based on this machismo. Uh, it's, it's, it's a regime in which you don't have to be confirmed by the elections because the elections are fixed, but you have to be loved and admired publicly by your population. That's what matters. And of course, it makes it impossible for Mr. Putin to publicly acknowledge a defeat, even so he knows that his plans are failing. Um, so quite a few commentators have made the point already that um, Mr. Putin would need to be able to sell um, the end of the war as a victory, to sell it to his domestic audience. I think it's getting uh, more and more impossible, really to reach that point, especially after the progress in negotiations in Istanbul recently when the Ukrainian authorities started formally and informally pulling the population on what the attitudes are. And when the polls returned with a number of over 90% Ukrainians believing in Ukraine's victory in the war, and when uh, representatives of presidential administration went to talk to some groups of territorial self-defense and, and the military about a possible uh, slate of concessions to Russia, and they encountered an attitude that what kind of concessions we are going to talk about because we are going to win this war, and the nation seems to be united around that. That too eliminated the possibility of Ukraine agreeing to a deal which could be sold in Russia as a victory. So really, we are in a very difficult situation and a scary one too, because um, with Mr. Putin's very success as a ruler, continued rule in Russia, dependent on some kind of victory, not over Ukraine, because he wanted to claim victory over the West more generally, really. Um, and so, and he is not even able to take Mariupol now, which some commentators felt that perhaps taking Mariupol could be that point. But of course, it's impossible for Ukraine to surrender Mariupol for a variety of reasons including the morale and such. But it's a dangerous moment because he can escalate violence. In fact, today there was a scary moment when the United Nations Secretary General was in Kyiv and Kyiv experienced a rocket attack while he was there with five rockets. One of them actually landing in the residential neighborhood and killing several people. So there could be scary things on Mr. Putin's part because he's, he painted himself into the corner. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so. Um, Olga has already alluded to the um, potential economic reasons for this war, and we have a question which asks about whether or not the agricultural capacity of Ukraine um, is part of the Russian um, motivation. And I and and Olga has has referred also to oil and gas, right? Um, so I wonder if we could have a, a bit of a conversation about. The, the rel how, how do you see the, the relative contributions of kind of geopolitical um, motivation, ideological motivation, and economic uh, motivation to the, uh, to the war? Maybe we go in the opposite direction and begin with Sergei this time. Um, no question about that, absolutely. Uh, the economy is important here, even so it is presented in a very peculiar way in the Russian media as the restoration of Soviet time unity. But the Soviet time unity was really about exploiting the regions producing raw materials. Uh, and Ukraine played an important role in that. 
And it's curious how the attitudes changed. Remember at the end of the Soviet Union, okay, some of us remember, at the end of the Soviet Union, everybody felt both in Russia and in Ukraine that the life would become so much better when we get rid of this unity because then our resources would be only for us. Both Russians and Ukrainians really bought into this, into this um, uh, slogan. But of course, by now, interestingly enough, the Russian argument is precisely that it is the West which destroyed the natural economic unity, and not just of the former Soviet Union, but perhaps of Eurasia too. And here the geopolitical constructs like Eurasianism come together with, with Russia's attempt to play um, on, on an equal field with China in Central Asia, which is not really possible, but events in Kazakhstan recently demonstrated that Russia can uh, potentially surprise China with uh, uh, some diplomatic and military moves. Um, so it's a, it's a place where geopolitics comes together with the economy. Ukraine is enormously important as agricultural producer, producer of uh, minerals, um, all kinds of things. As you know, prices are going up throughout the world um, because of Ukraine's traditional and to this day importance. But perhaps even more so, it's um, it's the, the kind of nostalgic unity that is read into it. Um, I think I think uh, the Russian media is actually very upset and doesn't comment on the fact, which is widely acknowledged in the West and in Ukraine, and that is that up to this point, really, the two countries were fighting each other with the weapons they jointly produced during the Soviet period, mm. or the weapons based on what they were producing in uh, in Soviet times. And, you know, coming from the family of two engineers working for the military industry. I can tell you quite a few things about that, right? So when, when Russia was bombing the certain factories as retaliation for, for, for the uh, sinking of uh, the cruiser Moscow, it knew exactly where to go because even five years ago, the Russian military engineers and the Russian military in uniform were still there discussing collaboration. Ukraine is actually very important for, for the Russian um, military experts too. So there are multiple things that national pride comes together with the economy. Mm. Thank you, Olga. You already answered that question in a way in your earlier comment. But I, I just, I can, uh, I can add a couple of things. Uh, for some reason in my mind, on the basis of I, uh, what I read about Putin, it doesn't, he doesn't strike me as uh, uh, an agriculturalist. Uh, he thinks bigger. And plus, uh, don't forget, don't forget, we have to think about those people who have to work the land they're being killed right now in Ukraine, who is left? Those people who might uh, repopulate the lands of, of Ukraine, the Russians, and they're not very successful today in the Russian Federation uh, producing uh, much of, of this particular product. Uh, but in, in light of what I uh, said in the past, in terms of this mentality, uh, to come and grab something. This is just probably something that is very important and, and inherent in this particular kind of approach, Putin's approach, to come and get it. And what can he get it? Not to produce it. Because uh, in my mind, and history shows those predecessors in Ukraine whom we might call uh, the predecessors of, of Ukrainians, they were producers, they were creative people. And that's why, according to many, many people's arg um, sort of arguments, that's why uh, uh, Ukraine uh, managed to create a shield and not to embrace this particular ideology of, of grabbing land, uh, lands and properties and, and robbing people. So uh, my point is that perhaps he might want to exploit the reserves which are under the ground. It's easier to build the infrastructure. It's easier to, to invite foreign investors possibly in the future. But I don't think that at this particular point, he thinks about even those potentially uh, good times for, for the Russian Federation, because he understands he's losing badly. And I believe this plan sort of receded into the past or somewhere in the background of his perhaps thinking. But 
uh, that's my perception. Oil, gas, something that can be easily extracted, not to to uh, you uh, to to use the um, land to produce something that might be attractive for the West, agricultural products, for instance. But this is just my perception. Oksana. Yes, we're of course all speculating here, and I might be, you know, maybe a little bit in the minority. I actually don't think the economy was driving this primarily, because uh, yes, there are these potential economic benefits. You know, we can say, you know, shale gas deposits in Donbass, right? Like the whatever it is on the bottom of the Black Sea, but there are also tremendous costs to this invasion, right? Like the cost of this military war. I mean, the the, the price of these missiles alone that they that they are shooting, right? the cost of sanctions, the loss of Nord Stream 2. And we may not have even seen the end of it, right? So if you are sort of thinking purely in the cost benefit in economic terms, I can't imagine that even if you know one is very optimistic that you could really make an argument that ultimately it's worth it, right? The, um, and I think all the economists, at least those that I have read, um, including you know parts of the Russian government and Russia friendly and so forth, I mean, everybody seems to agree that this is economically devastating, right? Um, so that is not to say that there couldn't be, at least in the short term, right? Like for example, now we have seen, uh, there are some reports that they are basically stealing grain uh, from granaries um, in Southern Ukraine. So if you can get something right after you invaded and of course, you know, exploit the territory that you occupied, like yeah, of course they would do that. But as far as really, really reasons for the war, I would say, I mean, again, as all of us, I'm speculating, but to my mind, it seems that these geopolitical foreign policy kind of ideational concerns and misperceptions, I would say, were more of a driver than sort of pure cost benefit economic calculation. Um, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions which are around um uh ukrainian identity um and i would like to sort of link them and see if we can uh talk about those a little bit so the the one question is uh about the notion that each person must have one national identity and one national identity only um is that to what extent is that a result of you know the French Revolution, essentially, 1789. Um, so that a, a very kind of a relatively, in, in terms of you know world history, a very recent um, idea. Um, and the other question, which is actually going in the a little bit in the other direction, is uh, a um, an anecdote uh, which is the following. I just read this from the from the um, Q&A. I worked with someone whose family had emigrated from Crimea to the USA in the mid-1990s. Back in 2005-2006, she insisted that Crimea was Russian. Um, but when I asked her if she spoke, um, if when I asked her if she spoke Ukrainian, um, so the the question is, um, you know, if you have any comments on that kind of notion that. Uh, somebody who seems to see herself um, or seems to speak Ukrainian, um, but sees Crimea not as Ukrainian, but as Russian um, in emigration, right? So there's several uh, layers here. Um, maybe, uh, Olga, do you want to start trying to unravel these kind of issues? Well, it might be not very systematic, but I will throw some thoughts which, which might sort of provoke our dis discussion. Uh, remember those books written by uh, Kuzia, not most recently, but uh, his oldest work uh, and uh, books written by Andrew Wilson. They uh, explain this. And by the way, Sergei also in his a uh, beautiful, concise history of Ukraine explained uh, the, the history of, of Crimea. Uh, Wilson even tried to, to uh, calculate how many years Crimea was Russian, right? And if I remember correctly, it was just something 67 or something like this, uh, more or less. So, but uh, having said that, I mean, uh, it's not to say that uh, today Crimea is 
populated by those people who um, think about Ukraine and think about perhaps uh, some future with Ukraine, because the dynamics, and we, we know the dynamics was complex. Again, those who uh, disagreed with, with uh, Russian policy, they, they emigrated, they left Crimea. Those who had some, def developed some affinity with Ukraine, who spoke Ukrainian, uh, who, who liked uh, the, 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 the system, um, social perhaps and cultural environment of, of Ukraine, they left. So what is what is left today in Ukraine? Those people who came from Russia, bought properties, and those people who originally, initially wanted to be Russians. So I mean, uh, under these circumstances, it's very difficult to imagine Ukraine as, as uh, you know, uh, Crimea, I'm sorry, as, as part of Ukraine as part of Ukraine. But at the same time, I agree with Oksana, we cannot, uh, Ukraine cannot just agree to, to, uh, to this scenario. If Putin, for instance, um, suggests that we will just take or leave our territories under our control, uh, Crimea and the Donbass, would it be sufficient for you? I don't think under these circumstances, the Ukrainians might, can agree to this particular scenario. Too many lives were lost. So, I mean, now the Ukrainians want to go further. And I, I think they will try to get Crimea and they will try to get the Donbass. The question of identity is another question, a very complex one. How can you uh, encourage those people who wanted to be pro-Kremlin, pro-Russian uh, to become again Ukrainians? I mean, uh, this is just another complex question and I don't know how this question can be solved, to be honest with you, I don't have an answer, but this is just something that I think out loud. Oksana? Yes, let me kind of follow up with, on what Olga was saying. Uh, first of all, on this identity in Crimea, I think there was, as in other parts of Ukraine, there was a lot of moving pieces. It wasn't kind of set in stone, right? And on the one hand, yes, it's true that Crimea was the most, you know, both ethnically, it was the only majority ethnic Russian region. It had the most kind of pro-Soviet, not even necessarily pro-Russian attitudes. That was the region where historically, for example, in the Soviet period, retired Soviet military went, right? So that was kind of the place for this very conservative, like neo-Stalinist element. I've done some research in Crimea in the 90s, and let me tell you, like the things that people believed, including about, say, Crimean Tatar de deportation, that was another aspect that if one were to get into the discussion, which ultimately I think is really pointless, but, you know, people do get into these discussions as to who's who has the quote-unquote, like, the the most authentic right to the Crimea, right? To Crimea. Is it Russia? Is it Ukraine? What about the Crimean Tatars, right? Like they're the, the nation that emerged, developed in Crimea. They don't have Poland state anywhere else. They were deported in this very brutal deportation in the um, Stalinist, you know, after the Second World War. They've come back since um, 1989. And uh, recently Ukraine passed the law that actually defined Crimean Tatars as indigenous people of Ukraine. And Putin went ballistic over it. He actually signaled, like singled out of all the policies of Ukraine that he disagrees, right? He was particularly upset about this indigenous people definition, because of course, Russians were not defined as indigenous people. Well, Ukrainians are not defined as indigenous people either. So I don't know what his beef is, but I mean, he clearly, right, like this, uh, in this very primordial way to debate, right, to territory, right, like who was there first in a way, right? I think Crimean Tatars can certainly rival Russian claim, right? Although I think ultimately this primordial debate is really going nowhere. Now, so so with this point of sort of where, where the identities were going and so forth, first of all, in, in Crimea, I don't have the polls with me at, at kind of the fingertips, but I remember looking when, when the referendum was, so-called referendum was held in 2014, um, there were polls shown from previous years. And since 1991, um, the preference for Crimea joining Russia was actually declining in Crimea, which is not surprising again, right? Because Ukraine was a sovereign state, sort of this normalcy of it was there, you know, for 10 plus years. Um, that is not to say that, you know, people wanted the same thing that they wanted in Lviv or in Kiev, and Crimea was an autonomy within Ukraine, with greater, you know, broader rights and so forth, like including linguistic rights. Um, but there was basically a trajectory there that was not in Russia's favor, let me put it this way, right? Again, this is not to say that there were no pro-Russian people there and so forth, but this decision, you know, to hold the to have this annexation and to mask it as a referendum, which of course was a total sham, 
um, I think was again Putin kind of um, I don't know, maybe overplaying his hand to some extent. Now, on the point of sort of what it means uh, as far as settlement, I actually don't think, uh, and Zelensky already signaled it himself. Short, I mean, I, I should put it this way. I think short of complete collapse of the Putin regime in Moscow somehow, like very rapidly and very dramatically, I don't think Ukraine would want to go into Crimea militarily. I don't think that's the plan. I think Ukrainian leadership realizes, first of all, that you know, as much as Ukraine has its support, for you know, uh, kicking Russians out of the territory that they entered in 2014, and it's true that there, they would be, they would continue to remain a thorn and create problems for Russia because nobody will recognize the legality of annexation of Crimea. But that's not to say that there would be some sort of military solution to it, and Ukrainians would go fight. Uh, you know, this now hugely militarized peninsula that essentially was turned into a military base by Russia. So I think, the, the, as far as we're talking about compromises, I, I can imagine, and again, that's given what Zelensky already said himself, some sort of compromise around Crimea as at least like kicking that, uh, you know, can down the proverbial road, committing to not solving, the, not trying to solve the problem militarily, right? But of course, not recognizing the legality of the annexation. Um, so that would be kind of my long-winded answer as to identity and the Crimean question specifically. Thank you, Sahi. Um. I think in the discussions of uh, the Crimean problem in the West, the moment is very often lost that the Russians became a majority in Crimea as a result of a genocidal deportation of the Crimean Tatars. And I think this point needs to be emphasized over and over because not only it links the Russians to the notions of uh, empire to that of genocide, um, and also I think in this respect, if we, if we look if we look at what is happening in Ukraine, um, be very careful before we dismiss um, the moments of economic exploitation or perhaps even colonial dreams of economic exploitation because they too, to a European historian, are extremely telling. Uh, and they are very often component of colonial dreams of empires, including the Nazi empire in Ukraine as well, right? And they can be indicators of why the Russian policies can be called genocide too. There are multiple, multiple connections here and Ukrainians are very well trained by history to recognize them because of the Holodomor. Right now about the identity, um, I have the other book, which is uh, called The Birth of a Modern Nation, which is more like uh, an extended textbook. Um, and the, the main argument of that book is that the Ukrainian state emerged as a result of uh, the Ukrainian national project, that it was the national movement of Ukrainians in both empires, which resulted in the creation of a modern Ukrainian state structure. However, once it emerged in the 20th century, it emerged from the very start as a multi-ethnic state, uh, recognizing uh, the rights of minorities. And Mikhailo Grushevsky very famously wrote in 1917 that because we have only recently been a national minority, we know how minorities should be treated. And this is the way they will be treated, he says, in Ukraine. So uh, it would be actually very wrong to assume, and I often see this assumption, uh, that uh, Ukraine only recently is acknowledging the multi-ethnic nature of its society. That's not quite true. So it, it came from this claim of national self-determination, which is typical of the age of collapsing empires, uh, the age after World War I, but it actually followed this line with interruptions for a long time. And now, of course, we have the war uh, which Russia made on Ukraine as a result of a revolution succeeding. And that particular revolution started with a Facebook post by an Afghani Ukrainian journalist the most recognizable victim of this revolution was an Armenian Ukrainian whose face is on graffiti and uh, all around the place. And Ukraine now has a Jewish president in part as a result of this revolution, no matter what his attitude to the values of this revolution, I think his, his attitude is also changing. Uh, so it's really difficult to argue for the Russian press, but they still do. Um, that uh, the Ukrainian national project is based on ethnic exclusivity. It clearly is not. But what is important is, of course, the recognition uh, that Ukrainian culture experienced colonial domination, was seen in the hierarchy, in the hierarchy of cultures as, as something 
kind of, you know, country bumpkin style, uh, funny dancing and singing Ukrainians. They cannot possibly be serious. That's a very imperial attitude as Mr. Putin has taught us now, which translates directly into violence and genocide. So these things about you know, culture, power and empire are serious. And so the colonial dreams are also very serious too. But what is then important is that Ukrainian citizens who do not necessarily speak Ukrainian at home, now in significant numbers came uh, to recognize the importance of the Ukrainian language. And as a colleague of ours, uh, Volodya Kulik has been writing about for some time now, uh, that's the trend that people do recognize the importance of Ukrainian and greater numbers, they declare Ukrainian to be the native language, the mother tongue and censuses and whatever posters. But that doesn't mean they speak Ukrainian at home. It just means that they recognize the significance of Ukrainian culture as a symbol of the Ukrainian state. And ultimately, it will be a good thing for Ukrainian culture. But it also means cultural things matter in military conflicts too. I think Zelensky is learning this lesson. And he's good with languages, by the way. He did a very good job mastering Ukrainian and now doing a fairly good job mastering English. Good. Um, we had actually on the on the uh, um, on the civic identity of of Ukrainians as you know members of a polity a multi ethnic and multinational polity uh, of you know united by the political project of the Ukrainian state. We had a very lucid paper by Marco Pavlushin in the in the first of our roundtables. Um, and th this actually comes back to another question we had in the Q and A. Uh, at some point about whether or not we will publish uh, um, recordings of these. We are recording it at the moment, but we haven't discussed with any of our participants whether or not we will publish this. So we might. Uh, and the, the place where that would probably be is uh, the blog side of uh, the School of Historical and Philosophical St Studies at the University of Melbourne. But this is we, we we have not you know we we are able to do this but we haven't actually decided uh, to do this i have another question uh quite an interesting one on identity uh, and that is about and that's directed at oksana but the other um participants might also have some ideas about that and i am completely ignorant about it and that is about the uh, Ukrainian diaspora in the Russian Federation. Um, what do we know about, you know, the politics, the, the self-identification, um, the cultural life of Ukrainians in the Russian Federation? Yeah, I'm afraid I won't be able to enlighten the you know, whoever asked this question. That's not something that I have studied in any detail at all. But kind of a few general comments. I mean, first of all, um, in the to the extent there were expressions of any identity, Ukrainian or otherwise, that was not in line, right, or was could be per potentially perceived as challenging or subversive or not correct by Putin's Russia, all of this has been stamped out. I remember, for example, a few years ago, I think there was some controversy over the Ukrainian center in Moscow and the head who was perceived to be, you know, too pro-Ukrainian, not, you know, having correct whatever view or so forth, and that person was dismissed and basically, you know, any kind of uh, collective organizing, right, um, it was in Russia that would be perceived as um, politically uh, incorrect, right? has been essentially stamped out. And I would say that would apply for any potential, you know, Ukrainian mobilization and so forth. I think, again, very generally speaking, my sense is that there isn't particularly um, strong sense of pro-Ukrainian, you know, um, identity that would be, say, clearly supportive of Ukraine and not supportive of Russian action now. And if there is such an identity, people probably would be afraid to express it. I mean, there is quite lively debate has been going on in the social media and elsewhere. To what extent this polls for Russia that show, you know, well over 70 percent supporting of the war, to what extent they can be trusted when people now can go to, you know, to prison for 10 to 15 years for basically questioning um, Russian official narrative of what's going on in Ukraine, the whole special operation and so forth. Um, so we are really, this is one of the challenges of doing any sort of opinion polling, right, um, in authoritarian content that we don't really know. And 
for that matter, the leaders of authoritarian state themselves are kind of left wondering, right? Are these opinion polls really representative of what, what we see, right? Um, there is some narrative within Ukraine, um, again, in a what somewhat fantastic scenarios, but basically this claim that yes, you know, not only that Russia is wrong to say that Ukrainian state is, you know, fake and illegitimate and so forth. If anybody stole anybody's territory, it's in fact the Russians who had stolen, you know, authentic Ukrainian territory, Kuban and so forth, right, where ethnic Ukrainians live. Um, again, I obviously this is a level of rhetoric. I don't think there is any Ukrainian government or whatever was, you know, pro, pro, project to say annex these territories or anything like that. But I think the question of the real attitudes in these territories is interesting. Um, last thing that I would mention, we have some troubling evidence that um, the Russian propaganda is really very strong um, in, in Russia to the point that people don't believe their own family members, right? So if they're talking about Ukrainians who are calling their sometimes parents or like siblings in Russia and saying we have been bombed, right? Russian soldiers killed children. And they would say, no, 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 like that's a lie, right? Our TV told us otherwise. So if that's really the extent of um, kind of brainwashing, right? So you can imagine many of these people are probably Ukrainian or, you know, at least have Ukrainian ancestry. So given Soviet period, right, and then ultimately post-Soviet period when there was no promotion of Ukrainian identity or Ukrainian schooling or anything like that, and since 2014 in particular, there is this very aggressive narrative how Ukraine is anti-Russia and the Nazis and so forth. Um, so I don't think, you know, again, this is not something I researched in detail, I should preface by saying that, uh, but my sense is that there isn't um, particularly strong identification with Ukraine among uh, ethnic Russians in, in, in um, and ethnic Ukrainians um, in Russia. And if there was, the, probably these preferences would be too dangerous to express. Thank you. Olga? Uh, a few years ago, I published an article. The title is uh, A Trial in Absentia. And um, I examined um, some aspects of Ukrainian life in the Russian Federation. More specifically, um, I looked at the institution, a, a very unusual, actually unique institution in Moscow, uh, the, the Library of Ukrainian Literature. Uh, and I examined this particular issue in, in the context of the Russian extremist um, extremism law. If, if you remember this law, uh, was very vaguely written and uh, actually what it uh, boils to, it criminalizes uh, any literature uh, written in Ukrainian and being physically located uh, in, in the Russian Federation. And on the basis of this particular premise, they closed, if we've we remember a few years ago, this library. Moreover, the director of this library was prosecuted, persecuted and then prosecuted. Uh, the memorial took, uh, I mean, uh, the, the famous group in Moscow um, <clears throat> uh, took a very active part in this particular process, but then they were criminalized also and disbanded, as a, not as a result of it, but I mean, because of, of Putin's uh, approach to, to all this um, voices of dissidents. So my point is there was some life in, in, particularly in Moscow, some life of Ukrainians who, and the epicenter, the cultural epicenter of this life was this library, which uh, no longer e exists. And I agree with Oksana, those uh, people who uh, has, have uh, Ukrainian relatives who have some sort of Ukrainian perhaps identity and those people who are of ethnic Ukrainian background, they prefer to conceal the fact. Uh, so they, from, 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 from uh, the authorities because it became dangerous and probably it, they will talk about this like in the Soviet Union in their kitchen, kitchens and that's about it. And uh, unfortunately, this is just a development that uh, uh, began to unravel uh, from the beginning, actually, when Putin came to power. There was a, a very distinct anti-Ukrainian stance on his part, part, as far as I remember. And, and uh, we, we see the results today. Everything that is connected or linked to Ukraine is being exterminated in a physical or in some kind of ideological sense. So he? Yeah, I agree completely. I also remember this uh, affair of the Ukrainian library in Moscow. And in fact, people in my social media bubble even disagreed whether the director was in fact uh, 
a Ukrainian patriot or more of a loyalist Russian trying to fit some kind of Ukrainian identity into this discourse. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting debate to have when the Russian state is exterminating the very institutional opportunity of expressing Ukrainian cultural identity. So it's going beyond the Soviet Union, which granted Ukrainians the right to have a kind of safe ethnographic mode, dancing and singing Ukrainian identity, but not the political one, of course. But it also tells us that there is um, a historically acceptable and very familiar form of Ukrainian identity, which is to deny the specificity of your uh, heritage and culture. And of course, in the Russian Empire, Ukrainians could become, could reach the highest, the summit of imperial hierarchy to become the chancellor of the empire, like Bess Barotko did, right? But of course, uh, the moment you define yourself as a group, which is opposite to the Russians, which is different from the Russians, then you become the target. And so these dynamics, which is available to Ukrainians and Belarusians, um, not to many other um, groups in the former Soviet Union, but Ukrainians and Belarusians for sure, it still continues. Not only are they afraid, but some of them very clearly embrace this notion of being from Ukraine, but essentially not different from Russia. And there are two examples of that that make us think hard about what it means for, for the future, because one is, of course, Crimea, right? Uh, Crimea, of course, the Russians did constitute uh, an ethnic majority at the end of the Soviet rule, but Ukrainians, 24%, according to the census of 2001. How many of these 24% were politically active or even culturally defining themselves of of thinking of themselves as Ukrainians is a totally different issue. Um, apparently, they either mobilized as political Russians in defense against the Crimean Tatars who allegedly would come and grab all the land, which was theirs to start with, uh, and in defense against the evil Ukrainian nationalists who would force the Crimeans to study the Ukrainian language. Um, and of course, the other such precedent is in the region of the world, which is in getting into the headlines in the last two days, and that the Transnistrian Republic, the separatist enclave within Moldova on the Ukrainian border. And uh, it's, it's very revealing, I think, too, that this is the pro-Russian enclave, which doesn't have a Russian majority. The majority is actually Ukrainian in terms of passport ethnicity, but they position themselves culturally and politically as Russians. So once again, modern identity is not defined you know, by blood and belonging. This logic, which is very much present in Mr. Putin's planning and actions, truly belongs to the mid 20th century radical right ideologist. Um, and it's um, appalling that the world is being drawn back not, on, not only into the Cold War, the new Cold War, but also in this kind of a logic uh, in which your political identity is defined by your blood and uh, the culture in which you grew up. So there are big implications there. Thank you. We have about six minutes left, uh, and I've just been informed that um, we once we say goodbye to our audience, we also have to say goodbye to each other because we cannot stay in this room without the audience. We will we will all leave. So um, this will be a kind of a rude end to this uh, to this conversation. But uh, so be it. But we have a little bit more time, and um, there there are two questions. Um, I'm not sure if we can get to both. One of them is about uh, the history of fascism in Ukraine, in particular um, collaboration with the Nazis during the Second World War and the kind of ideological embrace of the of the OUN um, in today's in, in parts of today's uh, um, Ukraine and what should be done about this from a Ukrainian perspective? How should the uh, state uh, react to that? Um, the and and the the other thing that always comes up from that direction is the Azov Battalion, right? Um, you know what to do about uh, this particular group. The other question, which was in the um, in the uh, Q&A, which I also wanted to come to, and so maybe we can combine those two in a, in a way, was uh, 
uh, I didn't realize Putin was so powerful in Russia. Uh, isn't he controlled by the Duma? Which I think is a broader question about what kind of a regime is Putin's Russia today? What kind of a political regime is uh, today's Ukraine? Um, um, and and in particular, I mean, and what 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 lies behind this, uh, of course, is also this wonderful book, is by Marlene Laruelle, who we had here last year. Is Russia fascist? And this is a 2021 book, and the answer was no. We had here; it was a very good uh, seminar, uh, and I mean, I I. I found that very convincing in 2021. I find it much less convincing in 2022. Um, so can we think a little bit about both the, the, the political regimes we're dealing with? Um, because of course the Russians claiming that, um, well, not the Russians, but the Russian government claims that Ukraine is fascist, right? Um, uh, and at the same time claims that uh, Russia is a particular Russian version of democracy. Um, so. I, could I have some reactions uh, from the panelists on this? Who wants to start? I can start. I can start. Go oh, go ahead, Oksan. Oksan, I begin. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I was going to say go ahead, Olga, but I feel letting me else start. Okay, I'm just. I think two of these questions are kind of easier, and one is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the fact that Putin is controlled by Duma is just simply not true. I mean, the the Russian regime, the institution. And yes, it has its formal institutions, they have elections, right? They have the Duma, but it doesn't really play any role. It is really a consolidated authoritarian regime, and that's just a fact, right? I mean, we can have much longer discussion as to how it came to be like this, but I think now there is no kind of mystery there that these institutions have any autonomous role, right? It's a facade, essentially, right? Just like the, the uh, now on the um on the question about um fascism and, and all of this, um you see the, the I think that the way to think about it, at least one way to think about it is to say like what do countries that have complicated historical past right like what is the correct way to deal with it right you can sort of whitewash a convenient past and deny them you can um you know um engage in sort of mea culpa and apologize for them you can do some combination of these things and uh, the way that ukraine and russia have responded to their complicated past which are complicated in different ways is really quite different so what we saw in russia is essentially this appropriation of this mantle of anti-fascism um, that, that, of course, was a common victory of all the Soviet people, but Russia wants to take full credit for it. Furthermore, they completely whitewash in this historical narrative, right, any kind of uncomfortable facts about uh, the Soviet-Russian role in the war, right, from the molotov ribbentrop Pact to the way that, you know, people were thrown in, the command didn't take any regard for the, you know, for the soldiers, to the deca decapitation of high command in the Stalinist purges, to the rapes of the, of the, the army. None of these things you can talk about, because that would make falsification of history against the interests of Russia, which is exactly the law, they have a lot of this effect, right? So essentially, um, you can't have any uh, discussion about this complex historical past. This is not how most um, democracies deal with it. In democratic countries, there is really rethinking and sort of wrestling, and that's a very complicated process. It's a difficult process. It raises questions in society, sometimes pits different parts of society against each other. And in Ukraine, we've seen some version of this, because essentially, and um, so the you know, Ukrainian history was such that it was caught between the two empires. And um, yes, there was some collaboration of part of Ukrainian nationalism you know, with the Nazi regime for the purposes of establishing Ukrainian states, right? Like this collaboration, we can say was problematic in many ways, right? The Ukrainian nationalists, some part of them engaged in acts that were obviously uh, very bad, um, the, the participation in the Holocaust, murder of the Poles, right? But at the same time, they also fought for Ukrainian sovereignty, for, for independence, they fought against the Soviet forces for many years after the end of the Second World War. So both of these things are true, right? On the one hand, they're sort of these bad guys because they did these things, right? But they also fought for Ukrainian statehood, and there is something to be said about that. So in Ukraine, after especially after 2004, discussion about this began. So the Soviet narrative, which essentially portrayed everybody fighting on the Soviet side as good, including NKVD, including the so-called Zagraditil Netriade, anybody who was on the Soviet side, no matter what crimes they may have committed against civilian population in particular, were the good guys. And everybody who was against the Soviet state were the bad guys. And the nationalists, you know, the wartime nationalists in Ukraine were bad, not first of all what they did to the Jews and the Poles, but because they dared to fight against the Soviet state, because the Soviet narrative was that it was the Soviet people who were victims in the war, not the Jews specifically, right? Like Babi Yar, which was predominantly Jews who were killed there, it was Soviet people, right? So that's another layer to this. 
Now, the way Ukraine went about it, I think could be legitimately criticized. I mean, I've done some work on the politics of memory in Ukraine. Like my personal take is that I think these decommunization laws, even though they were necessary, I don't think, I don't see a problem in other words, was them dismantling Soviet narrative. I think the way that they went about it could have been done better. In particular, I think there should have been differentiation on the both on the Soviet side and on the nationalist Ukrainian side of people who actually committed crimes against humanity and crimes against civilians, and they should be they should have been excluded from status instead of just switching the labels, right? Kind of now the Soviet people, you know, the Soviet side is bad and the nationalist side is good. But that's part of the domestic debate, right? So I think it is incredibly disingenuous on the part of the Russian state to sort of say that somehow these laws are proof of Nazis when they, they haven't done any kind of critical rethinking of very dark parts of the Soviet history. So I think this process in Ukraine is important. I think Ukraine should have been allowed and should, I mean, should be allowed as any sovereign state to wrestle with this historical past. I think the way the state goes about it should be open to criticism, but that doesn't mean at all that somehow Russian propaganda about it is in a way correct or is justifiable. So I'll, I'll stop, stop here. Thank you. In a way, I think this is a very uh, uh, comprehensive answer, but I do want to give the other two um, panelists uh, a chance to respond as well, but we are out of time. So could, could you please just briefly uh, make a statement, Olga? Um, I just, uh, Laurel's um, argument is just not very attractive to me. Uh, instead, I embrace the argument uh, by Alexander Matil, who uh, ex published extensively um, about the, uh, the, the, uh, precisely Putin's regime. And he has explained in detail Putin's brand of imperialist, imperialist fascism, right? And it seems uh, quite natural and symptomatic for the Russian fascist regime, by the way, nurtured by its dictator to erect a new cult, the cult of Putin. So it's just uh, something that uh, came to, to, to mind. And I, I think we, we all um, read his um, enlightening um, essays, and I, I think it makes sense to me, at least, uh, his explanations. Uh, the question about what to do with um, the Azov battalion, I, I think this is a question now, uh, very important question for Putin. He is thinking about what to do with the Azov battalion. I mean, because uh, they uh, exhibited heroism and, and patriotism, and they defend um, this piece of territory that is uh, Ukraine's uh, territory. So, I mean, uh, in terms of their uh, sort of fascist inclinations, I think uh, a lot of um, interesting essays have been written, including, by the way, uh, recently by uh, Professor Lieber on the Azov Battalion. And um, I mean, we have to see what these people do today. And very briefly about the, the um, this particular territory that Snyder, Ukraine, that Snyder identified as, as bloodlands. I mean, uh, who were those people who uh, were in, in Ukraine uh, during World War II? Ukrainians, Jews, Armenians, name it, all kinds of nationalities. And those who collaborated with, with, uh, with the Nazi regime, they were not only Ukrainians. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people, there were a lot of people back then of various back, uh, um, ethnic backgrounds who collaborated with, with the regime because they, not only because they wanted to survive, and I'm not justifying those people, but I'm just trying to, to imagine those conditions under which they try to protect not only themselves, but their relatives. So, I mean, it, it's just uh, preposterous to, to um, I think, to accuse uh, Ukrainians only um, of, of being sort of um, collaborators of, of the Nazi regime. I mean, we have to individ to approach each uh, case and each person individually instead of generalizing uh, and claiming that um, for some reason the Ukrainians are organic uh, Nazis or, or anti-Semites. I think this is simply wrong. Thank you. And I mean, the largest number, not share of the population, but the largest absolute number of collaborators with the Germans were Russians. Anyway, um, Sergei. Yeah, you, you stole my comment. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. No, but what I wanted to say really is that it is very often forgotten conveniently that 
for the majority of Ukrainians, the overwhelming majority of Ukrainians, the experience of World War II was serving in the Red Army or waiting for a family member serving in the Red Army, really. Somehow all these people got subsumed under the label of Russians, I think, really. They are not seen as Ukrainians in the Russian propaganda. The Ukrainians of the Russian propaganda are the nationalists and the Nazis, uh, which categories are equated. And I think the important point here is that Ukraine now celebrates May 8th as the day of uh, memory and reconciliation. And it has switched to using the red poppy, the symbol from the, the British Commonwealth and the slogan never again. And this is the way uh, which connects the contemporary emphasis, present day emphasis on human rights with the reading of history, which focuses on the people on the victims, on the civilians, and as those who helped save them. Um, and this version is open to uh, a more uh, comprehensive and more convincing memory work than the Russian version of May 9th, which is basically, I'm sorry to say, a celebration of the war as a good thing. Like that's the greatest thing which happened to Russia, really. And that's the that's what you very often capture when looking at uh, the Russian television uh, coverage of the event. The war is not a tragedy. It's the best thing ever happening to Russia. We need to remember about its wonderful victory. And of course, Ukraine is in the process of uh, switching to this more European mode of commemoration, which of course needs to include discussion of collaboration as well. Thank you all. Thank you very much for making time in sometimes very inconvenient times for many of you. Um, and thank you to the audience. And uh, I'm sorry that there are some more questions in the Q&A, which we didn't get to, but uh, we are well out of time. Uh, and uh, I hope we'll speak again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for thank organizing. You Thanks. Thank you.